Great. Well, welcome everyone to this uh, ACIL ESIL joint webinar on the topic of interstate dispute settlement at the regional human rights courts. My name is Mike Becker. I'm an assistant professor of international human rights law at Trinity College Dublin, and I'm also one of the conveners of the ESIL interest group on international courts and tribunals. I'll be uh, moderating today's discussion alongside my fellow convener from the ESIL interest group, Dr. Cecily Rose, Associate Professor of Public International Law at Leiden University. And I'd also, just before we get going, like to thank our colleagues on the ACIL International Courts and Tribunals Interest Group, and in particular, uh, Dr. Massimo Lando from the University of Hong Kong for helping to organize today's event. Now, before I introduce our terrific panel of experts for today's discussion, I wanted to briefly set the stage here a little bit. I think there can be a tendency to associate the world's three major regional human rights courts in Europe, the Americas, Africa, with individual applications. And there's good reason for that, because the sheer number of decisions and judgments resulting from individual applications, including no shortage of landmark human rights decisions, far exceed the number of judgments that have emerged from interstate disputes at the inter, uh, regional human rights courts. But the last decade or so has seen some important developments on this front. And at the European Court of Human Rights in particular, right now there are currently, at least by my count, 16 pending interstate cases, most of which relate to Russia's conflicts with either Georgia or Ukraine, or to the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And just this morning, as many of you will know, the Grand Chamber in Strasbourg heard or oral arguments in relation to two of those interstate cases uh, being heard together, brought by Ukraine against Russia in relation to Crimea. So this upsurge in interstate activity at the European Court of Human Rights has garnered a lot of attention and has also created a lot of new and important challenges. And these include complex questions relating to jurisdiction and substantive law, but also very difficult and challenging questions related, relating to procedure and fact-finding. And these are the issues that our speakers will be addressing very shortly. But while we see the uh, pending interstate cases at the European Court uh, of Human Rights in greater numbers than ever before, it's also the case that these remain primarily disputes that have been brought by injured states, let's say, rather than states other than injured states, to use the language of the ILC Articles on State Responsibility. So even as we're seeing or we're beginning to see more and more human rights focused cases in other places, like at the International Court of Justice, that are based on obligations erga omnis partes, we haven't really seen, I would put, put to the panel maybe, we haven't really seen at the European Court of Human Rights those types of cases despite the possibility to bring such cases under Article 33 of the European Convention. And meanwhile, at the other regional human rights courts, we haven't seen this similar upsurge in interstate cases, even while those possibilities also exist in those systems. However, there are other developments, at least at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, that might suggest that interstate dispute settlement is nonetheless taking place in other ways, which we're also going to hear about. So let me introduce the panelists, and then we will start with a kind of structured discussion for about half of our time today, or maybe 40 minutes, and then opening it up to uh, Q&A from the audience. Uh, first up, we'll have Dr. Isabella Rizzini, uh, who's a senior research associate at Ruhr University, Bochum, and is currently uh, a visiting professor at the University of Osnabrück, uh, where she happens to also be, be co-teaching a seminar on the very topic that we'll be talking about today. She has been an invited expert to the Council of Europe's Steering Committee for Human Rights to advise on interstate applications, and her monograph on interstate cases at the European Court of Human Rights was published in 2018. We will then go, I'm just going to introduce everyone now, we will then go to uh, Philip Leach, who is a professor of, uh, is professor of human rights law at Middlesex University in London, and until March of last year, Philip was the director of the European Human Rights Advocacy Center at Middlesex, which litigates human rights cases arising out of events in Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. 
He's also the author of Taking a Case to the European Court of Human Rights, published by OUP, and has supervised or served on numerous projects, advisory bodies, and inquiries focused on human rights, including the Turkey Human Rights Litigation Support Project. And then finally, we have Jorge uh, Contese, Professor of Law, Founding Director of the Center for Transnational Law at Rutgers Law School in the US. He's written extensively on the inter-American human rights system, is managing editor of Agil Unbound, and was recently elected to the UN Committee Against Torture. Now, unfortunately, our fourth uh, panelist today, Manasuli uh, Senyojo from Brunel University in London, is not able to join us today, so we don't have as much scope as we had hoped um, to consider the prospects for greater use of interstate applications in the African human rights systems. So I apologize for this late, uh, late ch uh, programming change. Nonetheless, I think we're in good hands. So we're gonna start with a few rounds of questions. I encourage people as uh, you're listening to us today to put your questions and comments into the Q&A. Um, and later in the session, I will hand it over to uh, Cecily Rose to um, get as many of your questions put to our panelists as we have time for within the hour. So if I could start with uh, you, Isabella, um, for many years, we didn't see a whole lot of interstate cases at the European Court of Human Rights, despite the original uh, plan that this was going to be a primary way of enforcing the European Convention. So this has changed a lot over the past decade. And I was wondering if you could introduce this uh, change to us, try to explain what's happened, and maybe run us through what you see as some of the biggest challenges that this poses to the system. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, thank you all for joining and coming and listening to me. Um, so uh, to get down to business, um, so why do we see uh, this change um, and this recent upsurge of cases? I would sort of point to two things uh, that I would find pertinent. So first would be protocol 11, which sounds a little bit technical, but it means um, that the European Court of Human Rights is now a very attractive forum Previously, so before Protocol 11 changed uh, how the European Convention on Human Rights worked, we had the Commission and the Court. So now we have a, a, a regional human rights court that is equipped with compulsory jurisdiction. So this makes a big difference. It takes away a lot of those political dimensions that stalled uh, human rights interstate cases under the old setup. Um, for example, cases uh, concerning Cyprus that did not fare quite well under the old system where the um, Committee of Ministers or the political arm uh, of, of the Council of Europe uh, sort of did not really uh, manage to come to some kind of important conclusions. A second dimension would be um, Eastern enlargement. So the Council of Europe and also the European Convention on Human Rights has gathered many members and some of those members, and you've mentioned uh, many, uh, are rather problematic to say the very least. And of course, Russia is um, and remains for now the main respondent. Um, Ukraine brought no fewer than 10 applications, Georgia four. So this is um, how the business somehow got running. And I would sort of put uh, this back to 2006 when uh, the, uh, Georgia started preparing its first interstate application. So the question of what are the main challenges with this? Um, so there are many. Um, they are jurisdictional, as you just mentioned already. They, they concern multi-forum litigation. They concern the um, overlap between individual applications and interstate applications, which are not really um, conclusively um, dealt with in the convention for purposes of how the convention was set up, where the interstate application, in fact, was the default mechanism to oversee the convention. Um, in those cases where we see the um, interaction with uh, international humanitarian law, we have uh, an overlap between these two bodies of law, uh, not always easy to reconcile, especially in context of the law of occupation. We have um, just satisfaction issues, um, so issues of how how these cases, when they are decided at some point, uh, what happens and who gets what uh, at some point. We have, of course, now an absent respondent uh, with Russia. Uh, 
And in most of those cases that you also just mentioned, um, the, the work of the court uh, still lies ahead. At the same time, we have a court that sees a, a budget cut with the Russian membership cutting down 10% or so of the budget and a court that is already quite burdened with some 70 plus thousand individual applications. So this is not a good mix. And um, the president of the court uh, in, in, in January said it very clearly that there is no more room for sort of improvement. Uh, there would be a, a more funding, which was promised in Reykjavik in, 2000, uh, in, in May 2023 and on the fourth summit. However, uh, I have not really seen this put into practice for now. So I would turn it over now. For now. Right. Well, that gives us a huge list of uh, issues to cover, more than we will possibly be able to, to uh, address, I think, during the session. Uh, so we will maybe we can return to some of those uh, issues with you uh, as we go through uh, everyone's um, remarks, Isabella. So thank you for laying out the issues there. Uh, let me turn to Philip. Um, so one of the points Isabella raises is the resource challenge here. Um, so I guess I would put to you as both a, a scholar of the European Court of Human Rights, but also a practitioner, what do you see as the impact um, on resources that this influx of uh, interstate cases is going to have? And maybe as well, if you might address the particular challenges that r relate to, uh, I suppose, questions of fact finding, and how, how is the court going to deal with the absence of uh, a major respondent in many of these cases, Russia? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um... For the invitation to join this panel, which is which is which is a, a you know, great opportunity, a fascinating discussion. Um, so, just to, to talk about resources, the, these cases are a uh, a significant drain on the court. There, because of their cl complexity, uh, because of the nature of the parties, uh, because of the gravity of of the cases, they are a a, a serious. Uh, uh, drain on the on the resources of of the court. There are cases that take many many years, and that's one of the one of the big problems. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to is that I think they take far too long, and they're allowed to take uh, far you know far far too long. Um, and there are other uh, particular problems that have been raised uh, in the litigation of interstate cases. Um, not least the, the fact that uh, the state parties tend to submit absolutely voluminous documentation and there doesn't seem to be any control on that. Uh, or, but on the other side of that coin is the problem of non-disclosure. Uh, states uh, not always disclosing critical documents. Uh, so you've got you know, different issues there. I mean, in terms of fact-finding, um, it's it's a really interesting question, I think, because the court has a, I would say, has a uh, very sort of honourable tradition of fact finding. It has been an, you know, of, of holding fact finding hearings uh, and even sort of on the spot investigations, and they have been a really important part of the uh, the work of the court going back uh, some decades. So, for example, they were, I think, the heyday of the. The court's fact-finding hearings was was the the Turkish cases, the cases relating to the uh, conflict in southeast Turkey uh, in the, the or the cases in the late nineties and early two thousands, where the court would send a delegation of judges in country, and it would be hearing witnesses as to facts, uh, and those cases were extreme extremely important, uh, not least in a, in a context where. You know, the domestic courts weren't doing their job of finding the facts, and that's, you know, that's been repeated in other contexts, not least Chechnya, for example. Now, the court um, uh, does still hold fact-finding hearings in the interstate cases. It did in Georgia, Russia, too, for example. It tends now to hold those hearings in Strasbourg, and it's you know, it's a it's a, a a more controlled affair. They might hear. 30 or so witnesses, both as to fact and, and expert witnesses. But I would say, uh, to, to round up on that, that the that, that 
um, fact-finding aspect of the court is in, is incredibly important and where the court needs to do it, it should do it. There are, of course, those who believe it's too time-consuming and too costly in the context, as as uh, Isabella's already mentioned, of, of you know, 70 plus thousand case individual cases before the court but uh, it's uh, i think it's it was hugely important in those in those kurdish cases for establishing direct violations of the convention i think that i think wouldn't have been established otherwise uh, and so it continues to be an, a, a, a really important aspect of the courts armory it's not being used in the individual cases it is as they say in the interstate cases so that's one aspect of fact finding i think i would also want to mention now um, the uh, potential for open source uh, 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 evidence to be used, which we haven't really seen in the court's judgments yet, but of course increasingly uh, people in the field are uh, becoming much more familiar, becoming uh, uh, able to submit that kind of evidence. Um, and I think the court, all the courts will need to be able to 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 respond to uh, open source evidence and to deal with it and be able to um, you know, adjudicate on it. So those are the some of the things I would uh, uh, mention initially, Mike. Thanks. Very good. Uh, okay, I think um, we can come back to some of those uh, points that, that you've made, Philip. Of course, the, um, the possibility for greater making greater use of open source uh, uh, evidence gathering uh, is really important and coming up in lots of different contexts as well. Um, okay, well, let's shift gears a little bit, and then we'll come back, I think, to talking about some of these European Court of Human Rights cases. But let's um, go to Jorge to tell us maybe about the contrast with what we're seeing, this huge amount of activity in Strasbourg, um, with what's going on at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Sure, thank you everyone for, for being here and for the invitation to um, address these issues. As, as, as you point out, the, the interstate mechanism in the inter-American human rights system is completely different. Uh, from, a, from, from a purely sort of formalistic point of view, uh, we have a similar mechanism, Article 45 of the American Convention. It allows for states to lodge, um, they're called communications, against other states. And um, of course, states must uh, make a, a declaration of competence to recognize the, the jurisdiction, the competence of the Inter-American Commission to actually um, address these communications. And, and despite the fact that this mechanism has existed you know, for decades now, there are only two cases that have been submitted before the Inter-American Commission, one in 2006, the other one in 2009. The first one um, was brought by Nicaragua against Costa Rica, as I said, in 2006. And it it concerned the, um, the alleged practice of generalized, generalized discrimination against Nicaraguan migrants in Costa Rica. Uh, that's the first case. Then three years later, Ecuador uh, submitted a, a case, a complaint, communication against Colombia before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights concerning the alleged extrajudicial killing of an Ecuadorian national by the Colombian army in um, Ecuadorian soil in the context of, um, you know, the uh, a military operation, Operation Phoenix. And what's interesting is that in the first case, the first interstate dispute in 2006 by um, submitted by Nicaragua, the commission basically took the task of, of sort of lumping together the admissibility and the merits and found that first it was inadmissible, but at the same time, the commission did find that despite not having to look into you know, other aspects, uh, there was no there was no evidence. The commission says there was no sufficient evidence of a generalized practice of discrimination um, against Nicaraguan nationals in Costa Rica. What's interesting is that in that in that complaint, Nicaragua basically said, well, there are six victims that they identified, and then there was a seventh sort of 
you know, seven point, the general Nicaraguan population in Costa Rica. And then uh, the, the commission invited both states to enter into a friendly settlement mechanism. Costa Rica denied, rejected that invitation. And the commission, as I said, uh, sided with Costa Rica saying there's no evidence, there's no sufficient evidence to establish that there's a, a generalized practice of discrimination. That was the first effort uh, in which we see an, uh, an interstate mechanism, dispute, uh, dispute mechanism. And the second one, the case of Ecuador versus Colombia, the states did reach an, a friendly settlement. So it was interesting that there was a convoluted process that took place before the commission. Um, and in 2013, Ecuador said, we're good, we're fine. We have reached an agreement with Colombia. We have some understanding in terms of not just military operations in the border, but also social and economic considerations that we are, we're satisfied with this. So those are the only two cases in which we've seen this actual mechanism of Article 45 being triggered in the context of the inter-American system. Now, this does not mean that there are no disputes between states in Latin America, of course. And so one big focus is, of course, looking at the practice of the ICJ. But we are concerned here with human rights disputes and not general public international law disputes, which that's been the task of the ICJ since at least the mid 20th century. And so here, uh, I'm just going to point to uh, what I see the most salient feature and the most interesting feature, I believe, of the inter-American human rights practice, which is how states have been using, and increasingly so, the advisory jurisdiction, the advisory mechanism of the inter-American court of human rights to handle interstate disputes. And so my, my argument is that it's a form of covert, sort of disguised interstate mechanism because the states are not resorting to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which the commission did a very good job in this, in these two um, disputes and sort of trying to do some fact finding, allowing for you know several iterations among the different states that were involved. But states are turning, have been turning to the Inter-American Court. And I'm just going to point to um, three examples here in this last minute. First, what I call Mexico versus United States one, Mexico versus United States two, and Mexico versus United States three. I don't mean to suggest that Mexico is the only state in Latin America using this. There are other uh, quite interesting examples. Colombia is one of them. But what's interesting is how Mexico, which is kind of a late comer to the inter-American human rights system, in the late 1990s, while it was having disputes before the ICJ against the United States, um, it it's it it used this mechanism, the advisory uh, mechanism, to ask the court, the Inter-American Court, about the right to consular information of Mexican nationals in the United States, without necessarily referring to, but very obviously in response to what was happening in the southern border. That's one. Mexico versus United States, two in two thousand and three. Um, the situation, the ju judicial condition of uh, undocumented migrants, quite clearly in response to a 2002 decision by the US Supreme Court. So looking at, at labor rights that are not protected in the United States. And Mexico three, Mexico versus United States three in November of last year, 2022, Mexico has requested a new advisory opinion to, to uh, asking the court to specifically address the situation of private companies that manufacture uh, weapons, guns, in the context of gun control, and what are the uh, efforts? The, the Mexico, the, the request does not talk about obligations, but the efforts that Latin American states must undertake to address this issue. What are the responsibilities of private companies, which opens up a very interesting question of the role of, of, of sort of business and human rights and private companies vis-a-vis uh, -vis human rights obligations. And then what are the obligations or quote, the efforts that Latin American states must undertake to address this particular situation that of course affects Mexico significantly, but also 
other Latin American states are much more in recent years. I'll stop here for now. Thanks so much, Ari. Uh, it's really interesting because uh, I think when you contrast this idea of uh, interstate dispute settlement and disguise through advisory opinions in the inter-American court system, it seems like a very um, a kind of elegant uh, tool and maybe a, a development that the court itself really welcomes in terms of the opportunities it provides to the institution to um, reach uh, new issues uh, or expand its jurisdiction in certain ways. Um, whereas, at least from my point of view, uh, we have a real contrast with the attitude or maybe the, the uh, perspective of the European Court of Human Rights, where um, the court in some ways seems perhaps uncomfortable or is being put into very challenging and difficult situations um, that take it outside of the much more familiar zone of dealing with uh, individual complaints. So maybe on that note, we can go back to, uh, if I could go back to you, Isabella, um, I wondered if you could maybe address a little bit some of the substantive legal issues that the interstate case is pending right now um, raise for the court, whether that relates to uh, IHL uh, human rights law uh, conflicts or questions about extraterritoriality or whatever you see as uh, some of the substantive legal questions that are really um, being pressed by these cases. Certainly. So, um, so the question is really if it's problematic uh, that the cases uh, before the court are the cases that are before the court, many, not all of them, relate to armed conflict. So um, that means the court has to deal with um, conflicts that are broader than its yardstick. So some people have called this the Cinderella problem. Uh, so this is a, a bigger conflict and a small subject matter or a narrow subject matter jurisdiction. Um, the, the limitation the court faces here is that it is basically asked to um, apply its yardstick, which is the convention, and not, for example, uh, use at bellum, uh, use in bello, or uh, other uh, sort of um, bodies of international law. However, um, of course, uh, the court uh, is, is not applying the convention in a vacuum. Um, it can and does systemically integrate certain norms of international humanitarian law, for example, um, into its jurisprudence. Um, it has been also criticized for doing so, not in a very coherent manner. Um, however, I would see uh, this um, as actually um, a possibility for the courts to prove uh, that it is um, able to deal with these complex cases. And um, maybe also the blame uh, or the problem there is, is not something that the court causes, but it's, it's rather a problem of, for example, humanitarian law, which does lack, unfortunately, um, judicial enforcement mechanisms. Um, so that means me these cases come before the court. It has a compulsory jurisdiction with rather sort of limited uh, um, admissibility requirements. And so these are the cases that reach uh, the shores uh, of the court. Um, and I would also say um, some of these issues can be really solved. Um, the only real uh, sort of uh, decision that the court has probably to make is in, in the context of the right to life. So this is where I see uh, there can be no fruitful interaction. There can be only one or the other body of law that applies. I would also say that um, um, the convention, uh, Article 2, the right to life, protects a bit more than perhaps uh, humanitarian law, um, uh, the procedural obligations uh, to um, investigate the deaths of, of persons. So I think um, the court there also has a possibility to reach uh, into these uh, sort of white spots in, in its jurisdiction. Um, but I, I think this can be solved and uh, should not be a cause um, to sort of uh, decline uh, the exercise of jurisdiction. If I may also to end, uh, um, point out a, a wording uh, argument here. So Article 15 of the European Convention on Human Rights that deals with derogations in the context of um, in the context of, for example, war, um, presupposes that the uh, convention can be and does apply in, in the context of a war. So I think this is something that the drafters uh, did uh, envisage. Uh, 
Great, thank you, Isabella. Uh, yeah, the derogation uh, issue as we've seen come up quite a bit as well. Okay, I'll go back to Philip then. Um, if you want to respond to any of that, Philip, that's great. But I also wanted to ask you about this particular problem of what it means to have these interstate cases that overlap with hundreds or thousands of individual cases arising out of the same conflict. What does that mean in terms of how the court has to manage its caseload, make sure that um, it approaches things in a systematic and consistent way, and whatever other challenges or problems that particular situation might cause? Thanks, Mike. Maybe I can just preface uh, my response to that with, with a, a, a wider concern that I would express about the, the difficulties that these cases raise and, and the courts, uh, I think that the, the evidence that which way the court is going. And I think there's a um, there's a marked reluctance from certainly some of the judges and some of the court officials to to have to deal with, as, as you were saying, uh, uh, cases are interstate cases arising out of armed, armed conflict, um, and I think that's uh, become clear from from statements that are, that are being made. It was expressed in the uh, the first draft of the Copenhagen Declaration in 2018, which envisaged separate methods of dealing with those kind of cases. But it's also in the substantive case law now, where on the question of the the extraterritorial jurisdiction of states who are involved in conflict outside their territory. And the leading case on this is, of course, is, is, is the Russia-Georgia 2 case from 2021. And that's the, the case about the um, South ossetia Abkhazia conflict. And the court coming to the conclusion there that uh, in, in the uh, context of, of chaos, in the active uh, moments of, of the conflict, there is no extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, now the Grand Chamber was was certainly not unanimous on that. It was divided. It was an eleven six decision, and there were a number of dissents. But I think what um, what I'm I, I'm concerned about these developments is that it, it seems to indicate the court wanting to and uh, not wanting to have to deal with those kind of cases. Um, and then turning to the, um, the, the 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 sort of separate but related question of of, of individual cases, as as you say, there are. Uh, often hundreds, sometimes thousands of individual cases uh, associated with the interstate cases. So, I mean, just from from our own practice at, at ERAC, for example, working with uh, Georgian NGOs to bring a, a series of individual cases um, arising from the South Ossetia conflict. Um, and th there are a number of problems with uh, for those cases and for the applicants in those cases, not least that the interstate cases take uh, such a long time, um, and it means that the individual cases are left in abeyance. Some, you know, for for, for years and years, uh, then they're not dealt with. Um, and I think uh, there are there are there are other there are other problems too. And what I would like, um, what I would like to see is the court actually instead of just simply giving preference and priority to the interstate cases is perhaps selecting a, a small number of the individual cases that are raised to and, and run them in, in parallel. Uh, and, and the reason for that would be to make sure that the uh, the, 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 the full a range of, of factual information evidence, the full range of legal point legal arguments being raised would be covered by the, the the first decisions that the court has made up, because at the moment what we get is uh, we wait for many many years and then we get an interstate case decision, and certainly another comment from British I would make is that uh, these the interstate cases are so often so highly politicised that the inevitably of course, um, but that the arguments the submission certainly some of the cases that we've seen, um, I, I would be concerned. Uh, if the court makes its, you know, these critical decisions on the law, on, juris on jurisdiction, uh, on the factual evidence, purely on the basis of some of the interstate cases, I would like the court to to bring the interstate, sorry, the, in some of the individual cases uh, uh, in with them and, and deal with them uh, sort of al alongside. I just wanted to remind everyone in the audience, uh, 
you should uh, feel free to put your questions in. I think we'll go for another uh, seven or eight minutes probably, and then open it up for uh, questions from uh, uh, everyone here. So I had a question for the, the everyone on the panel really, um, which is this idea that interstate dispute settlement at the regional human rights courts, whether in the form of actual interstate cases like we see in Strasbourg or in the uh, this idea of um, interstate dispute settlement in disguise through advisory opinions in the inter-American uh, context. All of this together could be described as part of this broader trend towards the, the disaggregation of disputes, as, as some have said, or this idea that states might try to litigate one part of a much broader dispute when they have the opportunity to do so, when they can find uh, some means to get some part of their bigger conflict in front of an international court, even if that might leave other very significant and important parts of the dispute beyond the scope of whatever court or tribunal is actually hearing the case. So my question for all of you is whether this way of using the regional human rights courts as a kind of tool of uh, statecraft or strategic litigation at this interstate level is this something we should see as an opportunity for regional human rights courts, an opportunity to take on a more prominent or robust role? Or is this something that is more of a threat because it asks the regional human rights courts to deal with situations that they may be ill-equipped to resolve, whether because of the legal questions involved or the resource issues that we've uh, touched upon already? Uh, so I put that to all three of you. I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, maybe I could go to Jorge first on that um, and then work our way back around. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I'd i like to resist the temptation to equate the systems, the regional systems. I think the, the analysis on interstate disputes uh, mechanisms is, is a very good one to, to sort of show how different these mechanisms can be. Um, many times when I'm when I'm thinking or writing about the inter-American human rights system or the court in particular, I tend to think of the of the uh, Luxembourg court more than the Strasbourg court when we think of the types of doctrines and the ways in which uh, international tribunals engage with states. So that's a first sort of caveat to um, be less uh, quick to uh, bring all the different courts into sort of a one single uh, frame or framework of analysis. Now, that being said, I'd like to sort of zoom out and 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 per perhaps re reflect and hear what others have to say and even folks in the audience about some of the trends or, or changes that we see in general in international adjudication, not just in the context of, of human rights courts, regional human rights courts, but even at the level of, say, the ICJ or other international tribunals, I'm thinking, for example, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and how those two tribunals have been, uh, by way of advisory jurisdiction, for example, sort of dealing and addressing issues that are not entirely, that are partially human rights issues. So if you think of um, you know, the Gambia case, versus Myanmar before the ICJ. If you think of the uh, Mauritius case, um, which is an advisory opinion, but it's really directed against the United Kingdom. And those are issues of self-determination, genocide, potentially torture. We're seeing more and more of those issues that are significantly human rights issues being um, lodged before tribunals that are not by definition, human rights tribunals. And so to your question, to be a little more specific to your question, Mike, I think the answer is, is yes to the extent that we see this, this form of these forms of strategic litigation in which states are seeing what are the what are good venues in which I can uh, present my argument, my case, and get a positive response from an international tribunal doesn't have to be the regional human rights court, might be a different forum, but if I can have my case, my political cause, my, my agenda sort of uh, 
uh, wrapped in a judicial sort of slash legal uh, framework, then I'll do that. So I will seek those those venues in which I can get a positive feedback um, in terms of you know whatever agenda, whatever cause, whatever cases I have, and I can sort of legalize and judicialize those, even if by judicial we are talking about you know non fully binding mechanisms such as advisory jurisdiction. My last point here is that I believe that with advisory uh, jurisdictions in particular, we see some some change in in how they're 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 used not just a, a completely lacking uh, legal implications, but having some some effect that, that could have very important consequences, legally speaking. Thanks so much, Ori. It is, I think, in some ways hard and misleading to try to look at developments uh, in interstate settlement and the regional human rights courts, apart from all of this other activity that's going on. Uh, it's in some ways artificial to talk about it uh, separately from all of that. Uh, so let me uh, go to Isabella now with my overall question. Is this an opportunity or, or a threat? So I think it's an opportunity and maybe I'd like to observe. So the European Court of Human Rights, especially, so this is what uh, sort of I know best. So we have here a court that has jurisdiction, compulsory jurisdiction um, to sort of deal with the worst of the worst human rights violations um, on the continent that certainly have further dimensions. But that's a very big value. And unfortunately, if we look around, there are no other international tribunals that I could think of that have um, all encompassing jurisdiction on the subject matter. So if we, we look at the ICJ, we have jurisdiction that's usually based on some compromissory clause or other that is even more narrow then we see what the ECHR can do. And the ECHR is an experienced court, as Philip also pointed out. It knows a lot about facts and fact-finding, and it's, a, it's an efficient machinery. So I think it's a prime uh, way to sort of, sort of show the value of such a system. And I also, also like to observe, as, as Jorge also pointed out, so we have we had Russia under the jurisdiction of this court. We have still a residual jurisdiction, and that's a very big value. While we don't have this in, in for example, the inter-American context where the regional superpower, so to say, is absent from the jurisdiction of the system. So I, I, I see this in a positive light, um, and I see that other conflicts that are currently uh, sort of there will will probably not see the light of a judge. Um, so this. Um, this is a value that I think should be underlined. Very good. Uh, and Philip, uh, the last word on this question before I turn it over to uh, Cecily for the uh, questions from the audience. Thanks, Mark. Yes, I, I would see this also as to, as my starting point would be to say that it, uh, these cases are uh, supportive of, of a rule-based international order. So that's 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 a good thing at a time when all of these systems need as much support uh, that they can can get. On the other hand, um, uh, the the cases certainly in the, the European cases uh, are not you know they, so they they are being brought by injured states. We don't have a recent um, Gambia Myanmar ICJ equivalent, but we did in in the past in Europe. We had there were a small number of cases brought by in the Nordic states and Netherlands and France and so on in relation to Turkey and Greece in the 60s and 70s, kind of policing applications, as it were, sorry, policing in the sense of states, one state policing another. And um, so we're not, we're not seeing that. What we're seeing is injured injured states. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's opportunistic. Um, and what I would uh, want to see much more of is is uh, states um, using this this policing mechanism. The basis of of these systems is a, is a collective uh, the notion of, of collective enforcement of, of human rights. And you know we haven't seen uh, in recent years in Europe we haven't seen that reflected in interstate cases. You know where was the interstate case on the Kurdish situation? Where was it on the Chechen situation? For uh, example, and I would uh, also just finally on this, I would um, uh, make a connection with uh, the the problems of implementation uh, of of the system and the judgments and states 
there are significant failures by a number of states. Uh, in, in some some respects, these are systematic, ongoing problems. And this is also a failure of the obligation of collective enforcement that states should be uh, should should be following. So you know, injured states may be happy to go to the European Court, uh, but where where are they when they're you know, when they're found to be in breach? Where are they? Uh, in terms of ensuring the implementation of judgments through the Committee of Ministers process that uh, Isabel has already mentioned. Thanks, Philip. Uh, yeah, that does seem like there is a, yet a big uh, opportunity space to be filled or an unexplored frontier in terms of truly using the uh, interstate mechanism to enforce uh, human rights violations, regardless of whether the state bringing the case uh, has been directly injured or not. Uh, we still haven't really seen that as I as I mentioned at the outset. All right, uh, we're at the point in the session now when we need to go to the audience for questions. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Cecily Rose. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have a number of questions that have just come in. I'm gonna select questions for each of the speakers. So I'll I'll read out three questions and then I'll give each of the panelists an opportunity to respond. So first from Larry Helfer, I have a question for Philip. And the question is, I agree that individual communications can be sidelined when they concern the same subject matter as interstate cases. Do you have thoughts about what kinds of issue, what kinds of issues individual applications raise that the European court could prioritize together with interstate cases? Um, and I have for Isabella, a question from Veronica Botticelli. Uh, and she asks, as regards the potential positive or negative effects of the recently released new practice directions concerning interim measures on interstate cases, especially vis-a-vis -vis the legal effect of the provisional orders to states and the possible need to arrange public hearings, what will be, in your opinion, the impact of these developments on interstate cases? Will states be maybe more reluctant to engage in further interstate proceedings in the future, given the risk of being held responsible for possible non-compliance with, with interim measures? Uh, and for Jorge, I have a, a question from Bruno Rodriguez. The Inter-American Court has stated that its advisory opinions are binding. In your opinion, are advisory opinions in the Inter-American system actually binding? How would conventionality control play a role in these alleged interstate disputes? So I'll give you all an opportunity now to answer, and then perhaps we'll have a second round of questions if there's time. Philip, would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you, Cecily, and thank you, Larry, for the for the interesting question. I, I think um, I I try to answer that by um, it's it's quite difficult to answer that in the abstract. But I think that that the idea would be uh, that to make sure that the the sort of full range of issues raised, say say in a conflict situation, um, are are being kind of covered and covered and, and considered properly by by the court so um so in addition to the, the court prioritizing interstate case as i said you know, selecting a, a small number of individual cases to make sure that you know the firstly the, full, the sort of full reasonably um representative range of factual situations are are are, are, are looked at and uh, and and that the evidence that will be lodged by individual applicants is also considered, and of course, and of course the argument. So uh, on on the merits, on the substance, and on issues crucial issues like um, jurisdiction. Um, so I think that, you know, I would want to leave, obviously the court would have the discretion as to which cases and how many. I just think are just as just a small number. Um, you know, it would have been. Um, you know, could, should we have had some uh, individual cases um, being considered when the court was looking at that, looking at the juris extraterritorial jurisdiction question of Russia and Georgia, Russia too, for example. 
Um, I'm not saying that the court would have come to a necessarily come to a different cons conclusion, but maybe it would with presented with you know different arguments. So I think that's how I'd um, try to respond. Yeah, hopefully, I've answered your question, Larry, in, in some way, anyway. Thank you, Isabella. Would you like to go ahead now? Um, of course. Um, if I may briefly add something here, uh, and then I'll answer my question. So. Um, one idea of how individual cases could help with um, interstate cases would be, um, I would put this, where there is smoke, there is a fire. So if there are several individual applications alleging, for example, the disappearance of uh, their next of kin, um, and the state alleges an administrative practice in this regard, then these individual cases could be helping to overcome the hurdle of um, prima facie um, evidence that there is such a administrative practice going on. And these individual cases could be sort of feeding in also in the merits. So I think that uh, this way of somehow using both types of cases together uh, can be very fruitful. And the court is in a position to do this um, while the court probably, um, while the applicant state has not a natural way of communication with individual applicants. So I think this is how, how, how this can go together. Um, and uh, now uh, to Veronica's question, maybe to give this context. So in the Ukraine versus Russia number 10 case, the case that concerns um, the war of aggression uh, by Russia against um, Ukraine, we have uh, seen now an, an unprecedented number of third party interventions. I think there's now 26 um, states that uh, member states include, and in addition to that, Canada um, that intervene. Um, and the court uh, has reacted to this, of course. And I would like to maybe first observe that um, these third parties could have been also parties easily. So this is very much possible for each state that is not involved in the conflict to bring such an interstate case. And um, also Philip has already sort of observed the absence of this type of cases. We've seen such cases, for example, in the litigation against Greece in the late 60s and also against Turkey in the beginning of the 80s. Um, uh, where certain states, um, for example, Denmark and the Netherlands uh, brought a case. Uh, but we haven't seen such um, similar action uh, in in the recent, in the more recent sort of time. And I think it would have been warranted as also Philip uh, observed. Now, um, the court has now reacted to uh, the, this perceived uh, or well, it's actually work for the court and has asked those member states to coordinate their work in order to not increase the workload. Um, I think um, I think the engagement with the court in this regard is important. Um, and I think this is um, a positive uh, sort of development that I have also personally called for. Um, and um, so this is, I think, will be lend strength to interstate cases. I'm not sure if I answered the question. I'm ready to, of course, do this also bilaterally later on. Thank you. And Jorge, would you like to go ahead? Sure, thank you. I'm just going to say one thing. The question was directed to Philip. Isabella also made a point. And I want to say in the Nicaragua case, the Nicaragua versus Costa Rica case, the argument that the commission used to say uh, there's no sufficient evidence is that it was only six cases, six individual cases. So under this logic, it could be that if the commission was flooded with individual petitions, then it might it might serve the purpose of finding that there's that, that there might be sufficient evidence. But the problem is that the last thing that the commission needs is more petitions, considering the in, uh, incredible backlog that it already has. To the uh, question that uh, Bruno uh, poses, whether advisory opinions in the inter-American system are actually binding, I think they're not. I think they're advisory opinions. There's a difference between contentious and advisory jurisdiction, and I think we need to make sense that that is still that it retains validity. The the, the distinction, um, the conceptual distinction, and the practical distinction between these two mechanisms, and the fact that the inter-American Commission understands, I'm uh, sorry, the inter-American Court understands those opinions to be to have some sort of binding effect does not negate the fact that, as I said before, we are somehow moving in a direction in which international tribunals are using their advisory powers to hold states accountable as if there were 
some form of, of, of binding judgment. The best example is probably the 2021 uh, decision by the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in the Mauritius Maldives case where, the, where the ITLO says that even though the ICJ advisory opinion of 2019 in the Mauritius versus United Kingdom case is an advisory opinion, it has, quote, legal effect. And so I think that's that's where we should be thinking of without necessarily uh, giving advisory opinions sort of fully binding on uh, the power. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to, in the, our last few minutes, just pose perhaps two additional questions. One is from Pierre Dorjan and is not geared towards anyone in particular, but is about the European Court of Human Rights. And the question has to do with the Qatar ICAO case, the International Civil Aviation case. The ICJ ruled that jurisdiction to entertain the claims in a case, in this case, extended to addressing the legal issues raised in defense of such claims, in particular, the alleged illegal acts justifying the taking of countermeasures presented in defense of a claim that a breach occurred. Do you think that the European court would reason in a similar way, despite its limited yardstick? So that's one question. And I have, uh, if time permits, uh, a second question. Uh, could you please, from Irina Recruit, she asks, could you please also talk about overlap with the ICC situation regarding Ukraine? For example, the same actions could possibly be described as human rights violations and also as crimes against humanity. So I'll give the floor now to whoever would like to jump in and respond, perhaps Isabella or Phil. Maybe I can very briefly observe. Um, I'm not, not quite sure that I understand the uh, question of uh, Pierre Dachon right, but I assume it's about counterclaims in a more general fashion. And so the ECHR system doesn't really allow for counterclaims, um, not in the way that uh, sort of we, we see counterclaims in the ICJ context. So this is because it is not about sort of um, solving a dispute between states and saying uh, this was a countermeasure against that. And also the countermeasure possibilities in the context of human rights are quite limited, as, as we know. Um, but it is possible to bring a counter application, which Russia has done and which we have seen in this context of the conflict around Nagorno-Karabakh. And, and we will see what the court makes of this. Um, but it has to be somehow always framed in, in, in an allegation of a violation of the ECHR and not in, in a fashion that would somehow justify uh, certain measures. So this is my brief takeaway. Um, and the other question, um, so, the way that I understand uh, international criminal law is that that one seeks to establish individual um, responsibility, while while in the ECHR context we are looking at uh, state responsibility types of uh, issues. I, I see no contradiction there. Um, it's it's just a, an additional venue, and um, the ICC, uh, if I may observe this, uh, can can maybe do more in terms of fact finding than the ECHR can do uh, in view of their bigger budget, uh, and that's the time and money. So this is maybe a possibility to fruitfully engage with each other. I wouldn't see a contradiction. I think that brings us then to the hour um, in whatever time zone you're in. And, um, and this would be the appropriate moment for us to wrap up. Uh, I want to express on behalf of both societies how grateful we are to the panelists for, for joining us today and for sharing their insights with us. This will certainly remain a very important and topical subject. So I, I think we'll all carry these insights forward. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.